Okay, look, um, thanks for coming along. Look, this little discussion or presentation is, is based in my uh, fortunate two weeks I spent towards the end of my long service leave in the Kimberley with um, Victor Hunter, who is some of you remember us, who gave the talk at the awards night a couple of years ago. Um, and it's one of the things that I would actually like more staff to do if we get the chance to, to talk about the kind of stuff they do, maybe slightly extracurricular, but certainly on their sort of study leaves and what have you, because I think often interesting things happen. <clears throat> and for me, this one was incredibly fortunate. Uh, again, I got to go to the Kimberley. It's the fourth time I've been up there with Victor. Um, always seeing it, especially for a, a white fellow Victorian, it's quite interesting to go to the Kimberley with a black fella because you see it from completely the other end. It's kind of exotic, which is, for most of us who grew up in Victoria, it's, it's quite astonishing to see I guess what most of us would call the kind of real Australia, uh, and as Richard Weller would call them, um, some real Australians. Uh, so it's a bit of a travel log, and it's, it's got some commentary about my trying to understand the relationship between white fellas and black fellas, black fella culture, um, the enormous kind of positives and negatives that exist up there, um, the starkness of the how amazing it is in both directions is quite breathtaking, really. Uh, and I do consider myself incredibly lucky to have travelled with Victor um, because both of us can talk underwater. So for the two weeks, it's it's pretty it's pretty full on just talking about issues and trying to understand. For, I, I guess for both of us, um, bouncing off each other, understandings and interpretations and situations. So, <clears throat> and of course, as part of my role here, I'm suggesting that. As professionals, you should do it all the time, and please don't underestimate how incredibly fecund that is to just be bouncing stories off colleagues, um, particularly if they come from a different camp, and what that might do, more particularly for yourselves uh, as architects, because you have to deal with the world, and it's often not your world that you're being asked to deal with in terms of making buildings. Um, uh, so there's a bit of me, and then I'll, there's a couple of quotes that I want to read. Um, and I've probably got too many images, so some of them will go fast and we'll just see how we go. Uh, I guess I don't mind if you stop me halfway through or partway through if you've got a question, if something's not clear, so I'm happy with that. The first thing is, for me, flying over Australia, especially during the day, is always astonishing. I just find it astonishing. Uh, and even with your shitty camera pointing out the porthole window, every now and again you can look down and just get the most amazing images. And for me, certainly as a architect designer in Australia, to try and understand this place, particularly its aesthetic values as presented and represented by the place itself, um, I find incredibly expansive, just trying to understand why this place looks the way it does. Uh, how, for me, how incredibly magnetic that is and then trying to see how others have interpreted it because that's what I find myself doing anyway when I try to do work. So flying over the land of Oz is always amazing. The title of the talk um, came about because where I was staying at Mount Pierre Station, um, just lying on the ground near the single men's quarters where we stayed was what was left of a cow. Um, or a cattle <laughs> and it was just the hoof I assumed the dogs had eaten whatever was left of the bone and I was just walking past it and laughed at it and Jimmy Shandley the guy who's the station manager just looked at me and said be careful there that bastard he'll kick you um, and of course it was just a classic line that it just came out of nowhere and it was quite funny um, because of course it wasn't going to kick me, but he just delivered it straight at me, and it was, and then just kept walking. So that was, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so where I was was near Fitzroy Crossing, which is in the middle of the shop. And some of you may know Fitzroy Crossing because it's pretty infamous. Certainly, uh, outside of Fitzroy Crossing, it's probably pretty infamous inside Fitzroy Crossing. But certainly, it's a pretty tough. Place. It's hardly describable as a town, but it is a town. <clears throat> and it must be freaky for people from overseas to look at 
a map like this, and you know, this is from Google Maps, and you know, see, a, there's a place called Mueller Ranges. There is no place called Mueller Ranges. So, if you're in Italy and you go, let's go and stay at Mount Hardman, that looks like a good place. There's nothing there. Like, I don't know why it's a dot. There is a Mount Hardman, but there's no township there. Um, and I was at Fitzroy Crossing, so right in the middle. And when you get closer, it starts to look like this, and there's the crossing up here. And we were staying out here somewhere. So, you know, it's incredibly populated. You can see the density of you know, urban sprawl. Um, and as uh, <coughs> his name just slipped out of my mind, the famous photographer in Australia who takes aerial shots, uh, Dutchman, can't remember his name. Anyway, he says out here, he said he loves flying over Australia because you can see the bones of the country uh, and you can see the skin, and that's definitely the case here. And where I stayed was here. In fact, that's the single men's quarters, and that's the ablution block. That's the homestead where Jimmy and Joy lived. That's the shed that always had the light on. Uh, and that's the community. What's the name of that community, Victor? What's the name of the community? Gallery Gorge. Gallery Gorge community there, um, which has about eight houses, uh, at least four of which had the lights on all the lights on 24-7, uh, with the generator going 24-7. Um, and there were only people there about 50% of the time. And I think when the people came, they stayed not in the houses with the lights on. So they got to turn the lights on in the other houses. Um, and you start to think, wow, this is such waste and incredible kind of abuse of privilege. But it's actually not that at all. And I'll hopefully try to explain that. Uh, yeah, they were the ablution facilities. But I used to wash here. I used to walk down to the creek past the car dump and wash down there because it was just so pleasant. <clears throat> and the country is astonishing. If you haven't been out there, any of you who have uh, been in the land of Oz for a while, if you haven't been out there for a while, particularly you visiting overseas students, um, I know it seems scary, nothing's going to kill you, nothing's going to eat you. It's probably more dangerous to swim in Perth these days than it is to travel through the country. Um, you should get out and have a look because it is astonishing. Uh, and there's, I think the technical term is a fucking lot of it. Um, <clears throat> and I was lucky enough to be up staying with, uh, with Victor on an Aboriginal, um, on a cattle station that was run by an Aboriginal corporation. And this is Jimmy Shandley, the man who's the station manager, and that's his son driving the other Toyota. Uh, and I'd been up here before, um, but this time the culture shock was probably more amazing because I got off the plane, Victor picked me up in Broome, we drove the 500 k straight through to, to Fitzroy and then on to Mount Pierre. First time I got out of the car was to go and sit with uh, Victor, Jimmy, Joy and her brother um, and they were talking about issues to do with dealing with indigenous communities and white fellows and stuff uh, and I'm the only white fella there so it's pretty culture shock for me coming from because I'd flown straight from Melbourne there. So it's kind of eye-opening. I'm sure for Victor, it's just completely part of the circuit. But for me, it's kind of eye-opening. And I, so I get to spend time with these fellas, and that was pretty amazing. This is a shot of Victor. We'd visited another community. Um, and this one, I can't remember. Victor will remember the name. Mungadi. Mungadi, which is about 80 k's from Mount Pierre, where I was staying. Uh, we drove out there to see a couple of people. Uh, this look is pretty standard, um, just vehicles in disrepair, stuff kind of lying around. It's not abusive, it is incredibly wasteful, but it takes you a while to get your head around how this occurs. The, the, and I've, I entitled for myself this photo, this is the photo of Victor in the land of good intentions. Because everything you see is done effectively with the best intention. And it just misses the mark, just misses the mark for whole lots of what I'd come to understand as quite complex reasons. And they're not as straight-faced as you think, and they take a long time to get together. So I'll attempt to get through some of that today. So this is where I am. Um, I had been out here before with Victor, actually 20 years ago. We were just talking about it the other night. Um, and this is a place called Gillambuddy, which is on the top of the Great Sandy Desert, and I went out there to, with Victor a long time ago to work on a project to do some housing out there. And it was an amazing project. Um, 
at this, in this incredible country, and this is where there was an old couple who were staying out there, uh, and I think the Toyota was in there, and they were living outside, because, you know, it's worth protecting the vehicle, because they can look after themselves. Um, <coughs> and we did a scheme for it. Um, this is a model that was made. Um, and it was never built. It couldn't, we couldn't make it through a whole lot of protocols. Victor was very brave in allowing us to pursue it, and it was kind of an interesting thing to do. It was better than interesting. I did hear somewhere that someone else had done something similar on another station. Uh, but I could never locate where, but I, this was published and someone rang me up and said, oh, I've seen that scheme somewhere. Um, so, we, you know, Mary Ann made this model and it was an idea about a different way of living. There was a communal kitchen, blah, blah, blah. So we couldn't, we couldn't get these through as houses, even though we thought it had things to offer. Um, and I got to write an article about it, you know, and I said things like this, interesting project, this one, difficult project, this one. I even tried to write it in kind of groovy, all over the place script. So it was, it was written like the place was, where it was inconsistent and slightly ragged. Uh, you know, as architects, this project was given to us with uncommon generosity of intention. Uh, this is another thing that I have to say about, particularly me working with indigenous communities, is they are unbelievably generous, uh, especially considering the condition that. We generally have put them in and the conditions under which they operate. The generosity is amazing. It was very lucidly and knowing explained to us that we weren't being asked to solve the issue of housing in remote communities as this was a much bigger issue than simply the supply of reasonable, maybe even suitable accommodation. That's another thing that hits you as an architect. You go out there and you think you can solve these things architecturally and you go, it's a, it's a much bigger story than that. You might, you hopefully can make some interventions into it, which may be more successful than others, but you very quickly realise that it's a much bigger issue than the one that you might be able to address, certainly simply via architecture. But nonetheless, we were very graciously invited to do it. It was, however, stressed to us that we should not, under any circumstances, repeat failures that had previously been visited on other Indigenous communities, particularly those visited on remote communities. And when I said before, it was a photo of, photo of us sitting in the land of good intentions, that's what really strikes you, that you see the best intentions rubbed up against the stuff of life and they just get, they just get nowhere and they just end up looking incredibly bad. Uh, and yet you know largely they were done with good intentions. Um, I then after that wrote, and it seems, uh, blah, 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 right down the bottom. Anyway, this scheme couldn't find its way through the accountability protocols. But we were uncomfortable because as you now read this, this was an article that was written, we, that's me, we get some advantage from the scheme. But the people from Jill and Buddy got a model, or was it some rather strange useless toy that the guttier mob, because white fellas are called guttiers up in the Kimberley, left with them if you understand this point. Anyway, that's enough. That's enough ifs and buts. So I was trying to say, again, we gave it a go, but we got more from it than the people at Jill and Buddy because I got to write an article and it got published and all that sort of stuff. So that kind of rubs on you after a while. So then we were invited again, slightly later on, to have a look at another community. And this time we thought we'd have a fiddle with symbolism. So we based a plan on a giant kind of fish, symbol, fish symbols and we did some Pretty interesting work, and Joseph Lavelle, who's now tutoring in the first years, worked on this one with, this one with me. And we thought we were getting somewhere, because we were really trying to open up the idea of what a house might be, how the communities live, the relationship to place, start with a symbol and suddenly all the, and all the rules are off, so you can really go for it. These rules which are repeatable, but they don't fit forms, you know, whole lots of interesting architectural things. We drew it lots of ways to see what its density looks like, what its composition looks like what its aesthetics, aesthetics are like. <coughs> we framed it up, we worked out how you might be able to build it. Yeah, we did images so you could sleep on top of it, you could sleep in it, you could be out of it, you could be around it. It had interiors and exteriors. It didn't have any glass you could smash. Um, could be made out of the local materials. So we pushed a whole lot of stuff. But again, it's, you know, it was very difficult. I, I again still feel very lucky that Joseph and I got to work on it and we got to this point, um, but it didn't go anywhere. So I'm just showing you these because you know I've been thinking about this for a while and because I've been thinking about it for a while, its impact on how I saw this last visit was quite important. 
Then, just for fun, Joseph and I uh, floated another idea where we thought, let's have a look at doing an Indigenous Place project. So, this one was for Victoria. We did some maps of Victoria, placed the communities, came up with a kind of way that they all might gather and then put it on a painting to see whether that might give us a new way to do it. And we did some pretty beautiful drawings about it. Joseph turned this into a 3D rhino thing and it was quite, it was quite a beautiful thing. Um, and that square is 750 metres square, so it was quite a, it was quite a big project. Um, so we had done this, looked at it, thought about it. <coughs> and I'm just saying this because give you a bit of background, and then I get to Fitzroy Crossing this time. And again, I'm going to say, if you ever get a chance to go up there, folks, you, you should take it up. You should go. It is astonishing in lots and lots of different ways. Um, you know, and it doesn't matter that the guy who runs the jean shop can't make the sign make sense, because you apparently only get one jean. Um, <coughs> but that's, you know, that's the shop sign in Fitzroy Crossing. Is that the same as the Lila? Uh, I think Samson July is actually filmed in South Australia because it's, it's based in that kind of that kind of tough environment. Yeah, yeah. Fitzroy Crossing is a town, whereas Samson July is really set in a what would be a remote community, probably. Yeah. Um, Fitzroy Crossing is pretty full on because, uh, but as I said, I've always come in from the other side. Um, which means I've come in from the Blackfellow side, travelling with Victor, and um, he was determined that I go to the Fitzroy Crossing Inn uh, at noon uh, because you get breathalyzed on the way in <laughs> at noon um, because the rules for drunken behaviour in the Fitzroy Crossing Inn, uh, they stop serving beer for an hour um, and then you're really unpopular. Uh, and the bar is... The bar's pretty tough, but it's it's completely civilized, and everybody's sit, sitting down having a drink, and it's seven dollars a can, is it, Victor? I think it's seven bucks for a green can, um, and people are very quiet. There's nothing else to do for most indigenous people. There's nothing to do. There's like there's just nothing to do, so that's why you go to the pub. Um, but the pub, as is the lodge, as is the supermarket as is, I think, one of the petrol stations, as is the hardware store, are all owned by the collective of Indigenous communities in Fitzroy Crossing. Um, and if we had more time, Victor and I could talk about, certainly he could fill you in about how much money they must have in the bank and how inept they are at making that money available to the communities to do things with, because they have no training in how to run a business, but they run businesses which can't help but make money, because they're the only business in town. Um, and it's kind of astonishing. Then there's wildlife, and there's the country, and the country is amazing. Now we're on the station. This is on the station at Mount Pierre. Mount Pierre was the station I, where we stayed. And to give you some idea of the conditions, I'm giving you a bit of background so I can talk about it. This is where I slept. This was my bed. Um, I slept on the veranda of what was the single men's quarters, and that was my view out to the fire pit. Uh, the fire pit where we sat around every night uh, with, and the crowd of people varied a little. There, in the end, there were about eight of us, eight or ten of us staying there. Uh, I think, in fact, it was about 50-50, wasn't it, men and women, um, males and females. Uh, many people related to Joy and Jimmy, the people who were the station managers, uh, but a few other people who had worked with them a lot. And there was a little girl who was about seven, uh, and Victor pointed out to me that uh, how come she's not at school, Des? Because <laughs> I, I was on holidays, so I just thought, oh, she's on school holidays. But in fact, she wasn't on school holidays. She was just out there, like 63% of the kids in Fitzroy Crossing who don't go to school. Because <laughs> the attendance rate at the school is 37%, and they have a brand new school. Um, but they don't go to school because school is kind of irrelevant, and the idea of relevance is a tricky thing. <clears throat> so we, and I must say, we would sit around here every night, around the fire, after we'd eaten, while we're eating, talking, talking, talking. Um, and for me, it was fantastic, because I'm the only white fella there. Uh, but also, for many of the people, Victor introduces Des as a professor of architecture from Deakin University in Victoria. 
And you can see people going, Professor, never met one of them before. What, what do they do? Um, so their acceptance of me and their quietude towards me was quite interesting and it took me a couple of days to get over that. Um, that's the ablutions facility, the shed in the background there. It's lots of frogs and calcium because uh, the calcium content in the water is just scary. Uh, Victor's working on that one. And there's another sleeping quarters, which no one's sleeping in that one anymore because that one's, that one's been trashed. Um, that's the kitchen. The kitchen was scary. Um, and these guys were great. I have to say, these guys were great. Um, the scary bit was I got used to it. Uh, after a few days. Um, but uh, I must say about particularly in indigenous, indigenous communities, uh, these guys are tough. Shit, they're tough. Uh, their resilience is incredible. Um, they just soak this stuff up uh, and it just rolls off them. Um, Stanner has a way of putting it that uh, indig he describes indigenous attitudes to life as a one possibility thing, a once for all character, a once for all time character is what the life has. Um, and it's this capacity to just roll through the specificities, just however life comes at you, it just comes at you. It's not something you necessarily have directional impact on. Um, it takes you a while to get your head around. Uh, and it's not that people don't care. It's just the care level and the concern level and even the empathy levels are operating completely differently to ours because there's a much bigger consistency they're part of. This is where I used to wash. Um, it was just part the, past the wet season, so all of that rubble on the here. Well, this would have been, you know, way underwater, probably a month or two months before I was there. So um, I'm just trying to show you the kind of how lucky I am that, you know, this is my, this is my bathroom. I was the only person using it. Um, and these are the people that I worked with. Uh, and we're having lunch at another spring. And that tin there is full of little brim that the kids have caught. Uh, they're just boiling away and that's lunch. Uh, Jimmy Joy just organising the crew. Victor there. Uh, we're just having a break from working on the station. Um, for me to be out there... These people, they know this country incredibly inherently. Like, they just know it. Uh, but their value of understanding it is something that certainly my culture doesn't, can't quite get its head around, that we don't give it any value. And subsequently, to a large degree, they don't give it any value. Um, one of the things that Victor is continually trying to do is set up, if you like, kind of tourism systems where we can go fishing with Lyle or shooting with Lyle and he can show us the spots and he can see that that's, that's valuable. They see it, blackfellas just see it as what you do. It's not valued by them because it's just what you do. But subsequently to us it also doesn't have a value. So the knowledge base that they work with is disjointed or disconnected from the one that we would use. Um, I think Victor would also agree that it's the oppressor system controlling the freedom of those who are oppressed because they don't like to move into unknown territory. Um, this was a photo that they just had in their archive and I just took a couple of shots and Lyle, the guy who I'll mention a couple of times, the uh, young bloke who I worked with a bit, he's one of those kids and I don't think anybody went hungry that that day. Um, do we call those Barneys, Victor? Is that the term? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's Lyle. He's one of those kids. I don't know which one it is, but he's the guy that I was working with. Uh, and this is what I was working on. I was working on a cattle station. They were a little bit surprised that I worked because uh, they thought I was there on holidays. And they thought I should have a holiday. Uh, but for me, it was an amazing experience to work on a cattle station um, with cattle who are just basically wild. Uh, a few of them see, they've seen people before, but not very often. And there were cattle in there who'd never seen people because they'd been born in the last year since the last muster. So, um, and that big bastard in the background there, um, he jumped that fence or a fence that high twice from a standing start. Uh, 
he was not happy at one point. Um, and Lyle was in there with him trying to get him to go through the gate, which even I thought was way too brave. Um, but luckily the second time he jumped the fence, he jumped into the corral where we wanted him. So he outsmarted himself just slightly. Uh, but to see, he must weigh two tonne, Victor? To see a two tonne animal jump a two metre high fence from a standing start and straddle across it and just mangle it on the way through, it was pretty breathtaking. This guy, Jimmy, who he's the, this is an early photo of him, he's the station manager. Um, He's an amazing guy. His father and Joy's father, and I'm saying these things because it, 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 it gives you some sense of, for me anyway, the background of this guy and particularly his wife and then his kids and their grandchildren, the background they've come from and then how he now operates in the world. Um, so Jimmy's father and Joy's father, I understood, were really powerful lawmen in their respective camps. And I think Jim's father set up a community that the Gundiandi people now occupy. Is that right, Vic? Yeah. And Joy, she comes from a different, she comes from south of Fitzroy Crossing out in the desert country. And her father was another big lawman. I didn't get to meet them. Of course, they've passed away some time ago. And Jimmy's worked on stations his whole life. Um, Go-go station. So he knows all you need to know about sinking bores, getting water, dealing with cattle. He's now the station manager. He's the station manager. He, he's an incredibly capable guy, works incredibly hard. Okay, But he's, he's had no training whatsoever. He has had, definitely had no managerial training whatsoever. So for him to organise the station is all from first principles, almost from scratch, all day, every day. And he's turned the station around from a $750,000 loss because the guys who had took it over after he started it with his wife ran it into the ground for the, for the sum of seven hundred fifty grand. And Jimmy and Joy in three years have turned it around to be two hundred fifty grand in front. Right? He gets paid fifty grand a year to do that. Right? And he drives his own vehicle and he puts largely the fuel in his own vehicle. And he thinks he's on a good wicket. Um, because there's no one showing him or training him or telling him about what his rights are, what his responsibilities are, any of that stuff. So as long as he's turning it around and he's an indigenous man working for an indigenous community, running an indigenous cattle farm, that just ticks every positive box. But he doesn't get any support for it. And because his implicit tradition is to sustain conflict avoidance, treat life as it comes, see the bigger picture that just rolls on, and not argue and complain, he just rolls on. And of course everybody thinks he's fine. He's fine. But he's up against it all day, every day. And the other people who are working under him, they're working under Jim. So Jim does all the thinking for them. Because that's how they operate. Because the network hierarchy system is still in place. As Stanis says, somewhere here, he says, I'm suggesting that the associate, and this is for us to try and get our head around how this works. And if it's not clear, I'm not surprised, but I'll try to illuminate a little bit. Stanner, who's a, I think is a really interesting and great writer about, um, he's a white fellow trying to write about how he understands indigenous culture. Uh, I'm suggesting that the association of, Euro of European and Aboriginal has been a struggle of partial blindness, often darkened to sightlessness on our part by the continuity of the Aborigines' implicit tradition. And he says, implicitness does not imply lack of power. By implicit tradition, he, I think he's trying to get at the fact that for someone like Jimmy and many Indigenous people, particularly in communities where the communities are pretty kind of stable and intact, 50,000 years of tradition is still right there. <laughs> like Jimmy standing under paintings, which are quite remarkable. He, he's one of the few people who've been back to this place. Um, that is, as Stana says, implicit. But for us, implicitness is in the background and we don't give it any credibility. But it affects so much about the way he operates. 
but because we don't see its condition, we only see him relative to the way we work. We can't see the other thing that he's working with, which is his implicit tradition, which is incredibly powerful about his responsibility, who he's connected to, where he gets training from, all of that stuff, as well as things that I've mentioned like conflict avoidance, no complaining, and just rolling through life. Because life is a big, overarching, consistent thing, right? Which they just... They're just, on, they're just on a roll with. It's not something that you impact. Because this is where Jimmy went to school. <laughs> and remember that Jim's 64? Yeah. So when he was born, he was part of the flora and fauna. Um, so he went to school in this cave <laughs> where Victor's now standing. Um, I think I'm right in saying that, Victor. That's where he went to school. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty amazing for me to go there and go, really? That was, that was where he went to school. And now he's a station manager. Um, the school, as an archaeological, was well, a natural phenomenon, it's quite amazing. You go, shit, really? That's where you went to school. God, we really didn't care that much, did we? But now he's a station manager. And he knows all about the artesian bore that he and Victor are now talking about. <clears throat> so his background is coupled with the things that I'm trying to unfold for you. So to see him operate and to see the other people operate, you have to try and get your head around how impactful this completely other tradition and condition is on the way they operate. Because it's not simply the one that I use. Um, you know, and we love a good sign, you know, big dam and pothole, because there's only two places to go, but the trucks kept going to the wrong one, because you always choose the wrong one. Um, and I couldn't see the dam at big dam, and I'm not sure there's a pothole or a pothole, but that doesn't really matter. Um, so, uh, again, this is what I was, they were doing helicopter mustering. I didn't get to go in the chopper, but there's Jimmy talking to the chopper driver. Um, and I'll give you this example. The chopper driver gets paid 15 grand a day, uh, and there was two choppers for that day. There's enough cattle brought in to no worries deal with the cost of the choppers. But Victor suggested to Lyle that, because um, Victor is always trying to expand, particularly these guys, expand their world. Because their world keeps getting smaller and smaller and tighter and tighter. Because the outside world just gets scarier and scarier because you get more and more removed from it. So when you're oppressed, freedom idea, this is something I get from Victor, a lot from Victor, the freedom thing is scary because it's the unknown. So you stay within the known. Even for someone like Lyle, who's 18 years old, um, he's a pretty handy guy. Yeah, he didn't go to enough school, so probably reading and writing is not one of his strong points. But Victor said to him, would you like to be a helicopter driver, uh, flyer? And of course, you can see Lyle going, you fucking bet I would. Um, but of course, he says straight away, because he can see there's a form involved, you have to go to town, you have to study in Broome, I'm in Fitzroy, too hard. Victor says, I've got people who can help you, blah, blah, blah. You can see Dot. Well, he's 18. Like, 18, you're pretty gung ho as a young guy at 18. He's just going, no, nah, too hard. Just too fraught. He can surf his way around the phone. He can find anything on the interweb he wants. He can do all that kind of stuff. But having the kind of what we might call the fortitude to go out there and be the chopper driver. Just a little bit edgy. I'm sure Victor's still working on him to try and get him to do it. But that, for me, that was an incredibly powerful example because I saw it in his eyes straight away. I could see him go straight away, you betcha, no thanks. Just too difficult. <clears throat> As an architect, of course, you go and visit these places and you can't help taking architectural photographs because there's amazing stuff goes on. And this is part of my occupational health and safety instructions, you know, because these are the working conditions, you know, they're just, it's, you know, there's lots of high-vis vests and gloves and stuff. Um, and you do marvel at the equipment, because uh, that little ratchet cog there is made out of little square six by six flat bar, which are then welded onto the curb, and you go, that's pretty, that's pretty clever. Um, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, but it's a pretty clever way to make a little ratchet so that it's almost indestructible because there's a two-ton bull going to be in there at some point who's absolutely keen to not be in there. And it's a pretty good little model. 
And you know, you can get some good shots. So here's more occupational health and safety, just to give you an idea about the world that these guys generally operate in. Yep, it's Toyota Dreaming. Neither of them are registered. Uh, they both went pretty well. They were both pretty hammered. Um, but we had to drive 50 k's down the highway to get from the house <laughs> to the station. And they're both unregistered. And Lyle's 18, but he doesn't have a license anymore. Uh, and he was driving one of them. <laughs> it's just what you do. Like, you just roll on. Um, and I was driving one of them. I probably shouldn't say that because the vice chancellor will now sack me for not having my high vis vest on and driving an unregistered vehicle. Um, but this is the standard working conditions. Uh, that, uh, Billy's working on chipping away at that metal so that Lyle can weld it with the welder. And I'm pretty gung-ho, but um, the leads on the welder were so shot that um, every time it touched one of the metal, the bare wires were there, it would half weld itself to the metal rod. And Lyle's standing there in his shorts with this thing dangling around his legs. <laughs> I'm going, I can't watch it anymore, Lyle. I'm going to find some fabric and I'm going to tie it around the bare 450 volt cable that's rubbing up against your leg every now and again. He thought I was being a bit of a Nancy boy, I think, but I, I felt a little bit better for doing it. Um, he thought absolutely nothing of it. Um, which, and it's not carelessness, it's not couldn't care less, it's not irresponsible, it's, I came to see it as just what Stan has said, just, it's a one possibility thing. Life just, you just roll through it. It's a bigger thing than you and your impact on it is not something that you're so overtly, transitionally conscious of like we are. So when, to us it looks like many Indigenous people are irresponsible, it's that the sense of responsibility has been completely removed from them. <laughs> because the government, which is us, have said to them from day one largely, and people like Victor are a huge exception somehow, have just said, sure, whatever you do, it's fine. Like we'll give them, effectively, they get a house, whether they ask for it or not. And then wonder why we don't, why they don't treat it properly. And they go, well, we didn't ask for it. <laughs> and then it breaks, the house breaks, like the plumbing breaks, and conflict avoidance means, Jesus, I'm not complaining, I'll just move out. And of course you move out and then the house falls into disrepair. And then a year later, someone comes back and says, what'd you do to the house? They go, oh, shit, sorry, I didn't mean to do it. And I didn't ask for it, you gave it to me. So what's, what's the complaint mechanism for? Uh, and this goes through everything, including, and it falls down to us as looking like irresponsible, but it's not irresponsible. It's the mechanism of responsibility and the system that they work within is completely different to ours. Because they're incredibly caring, they're incredibly generous, and they are responsible, but it's a different kind of responsibility. And of course, you know, one of them breaks down um, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I went bats an eyelid, like, sure, just roll on. Yeah, we'll fix it. Eventually we'll get it fixed. And Harry there, he reckons he's got it sorted and we're pumping, pumping. And Harry and Billy are completely unfazed by this. Um, I should say that in the back you can see there's a couple of spare tyres. And before we'd left, well, before the, when we left the next day, the back tyre on this particular vehicle was a bit flat. And we had the compressor going, and this is an example of the non-sequential thinking. We had the compressor going, and Victor said to Billy, oh, you better pump up the tyre on the back of the red one, because it's a bit flat. And I kid you not, Billy looked at us completely straight-faced, and he's standing there holding the compressor tube, and he says, what would I do that for? We've got two spares. Really? And he just looks at us like we were from Mars. Why would I pump up the tyre? We've got two spares. We're safe. <laughs> and we had to use one of the spares. So he might have had the last laugh on us, but the one that we had to change was not the one that was partially flat anyway. So this directness about the specificity is something that just keeps, it just keeps throwing me every time. He was completely unfazed by it. He wasn't having a go at us. He wasn't joking. He just said, 
Why would I pump it up? I've got two spares. If the issue is we need another tyre, we've got two tyres. It's not a problem. I don't need to pump it up now, so why would I? To us, it doesn't make sense, but to him it was completely, completely down the line. <coughs> and then, of course, you need the correct tool for the correct job, or as Victor and I found you need to go, the right tool for the right job, hand me that fucking crowbar. Uh, this was the closest we could get to a screwdriver, <laughs> which just happened to be a one and a half inch chisel, which was never going to cut timber. It might bruise your finger. Um, it did eventually get us out of trouble, yeah. but only just. And when we got back to the station, Jimmy solved it absolutely completely without any recognition whatsoever. Um, he knew how to fix it. And so I helped these guys put fences back up over, over creeks, which, you know, a month before had probably been five metres deep in water. So the fence just gets taken out and we just go out and put it back together. And they just happily work with me. Um, for me, it's amazing, amazing experience um, to work with this guy, Billy, who is an amazing character. Uh, but could sit around all night around the campfire um, and listen to endless stories about things, conversations about people, um, and hardly join in. Hardly join in because it's, it's just a little bit too outside his comfort zone, particularly with Des there, who he doesn't know, and Victor, who he did know a little bit, and then other people moving in and out. Com could sit there all night listening to us tell stories. And black fellas have stories for everything. I have to say that. I learned that really early on. I certainly got that from Victor. The specificity about things is something that we also, I struggle with. Because we abstract and we aggregate things brilliantly. We aggregate into this and this and this. You add them together and it ends up in this category. Indigenous culture doesn't work like that. There are just spe specific stories about everything. And they've got a million of them. And they all belong very specifically. So that's why Billy says, why would I pump up the tyre? I've got spares. Because he doesn't, he doesn't need to add thing, pump up tyre, don't need spare. He just goes, oh, if the flight tyre goes down, I've got a spare. Not a problem. That's his specific story. You see it time and time again. And Billy was definitely one of those guys. Yeah, and it's great fun. You know, they just, these guys just know the country. So making morning tea and stuff, yeah, it looks easy, but... They just roll, they just roll into it. Um, and for someone from the city, I'm used to camping a bit. It was, it was just great to see it. See them in, so I feel like a visitor, I feel like an alien. And yet, you know, to quote the Qantas ad, I call this place home. But this is really home for these guys. Yeah. <coughs> um, I've kind of lost my way a little bit, which is not really a problem, I suppose. But the other thing that comes from this, which struck me this time, um, and I think it troubles everybody, and I'm just going to say it to you because I don't know, it's worth trying to get your head around, is the waste is incredible. <laughs> the, just the sheer waste of stuff is incredible. Um, just, this is just for Mount Pierre Station. It's just vehicle after vehicle after vehicle, just stripped, wrecked, bashed. And you know, these are old ones, but there's stuff there with number plates on it. <laughs> one there, there's one car there that must have been there maybe a month. Um, it was on its side <laughs> and it was starting to disappear. <laughs> uh, people are suggesting things like, because there's no jobs, this is the other thing about the outstation things, um, where people are saying close them and I'll bet get political here, because I do agree with, certainly I got it from Victor, but I agree with it. There are people living in these places like the station next door, the our station next to it, there's nothing to do. Like there's nothing to do. And of course people want to be out there and they go, oh, we need jobs. And Victor would say, well, what are you going to do? Put the jobs in a semi-trailer and truck them out there for them. There are no jobs. <laughs> there's nothing to do. So people are suggesting what you should do is get these guys to strip these vehicles down, package up all the parts and send them down to Melbourne or Sydney. Because there is no occupational health and safety up here, but you can't go to the Geelong Records and go out the back and get the rear vision mirror for that Commodore you just bought. Because occupational health and safety won't allow you to do it. So they're suggesting, people are saying, well, why don't we turn that into an industry? Because there's so much waste, why don't we use some of the waste? Um, and I found these things quite interesting and challenging. You know, and the Gillerong community bus 
somehow ended up on the Mount Pierre station, not quite in the condition that it maybe got there in. Um, you know, and everybody wants a, was it a H something ute, is it? Yeah. Someone drove it there. It's not going to drive away though. Um, uh, some bits just confound you, and I had to put this in because Victor sent me the photo. Um, the guy, the guy who threw the boulder big enough to do that to the windscreen of the car is the owner of the vehicle. <laughs> and I believe his wife was in it at the time. <laughs> and she was going to go to town and he didn't think it was a good idea. And the vehicle's been there for months? Two years. Two years. Make that 24 months. When we were there, we were pinching petrol out of it so we could start another motor on something else. And it's just going to sit there and just, it's in the shed. <laughs> so it's not getting rained on. <laughs> Two years it's been there. They drove it into the shed and they won't drive it out of the shed because uh, they've got another vehicle. Another vehicle came from somewhere else. Um, disconnections, okay, here's a good disconnection story and Victor can correct me if I'm wrong, but disconnection story. The intervention where, and certainly Victor always refers to them as the troops. So, the intervention. The government says, we're going to hold 30% of your um, Centrelink monies, so you can only spend it on certain things. Yeah? But no one explains to the troops why this has happened, what's supposed to happen, what are the advantages, you know, what is the outcome. It just happens. So, you know, these three guys, every week go, Jesus, 30% less than we ever had. And then, a year down the track, Kevin looks at his bank account and says, Jesus, look how much money I've got. And then Vero and Diego look at theirs and go, Toyota's on the list of things we can do with the money. Let's go and get a Toyota. So they go and get a Toyota with the money from the intervention. Because no one explained what it was for. They didn't spend it on food and stuff like they were supposed to, because no one explained it. They just made it through because there was 30% less money that was just showing up anyway. And then they can't get another Toyota because they can. Of course they can. And it's completely legit. No one's scamming the system. No one's doing anything bad. But no one's explaining down the line exactly what all this is for and how this is supposed to unfold. So you get these damning images back to us because it's completely non-sequential at the other end. And of course the more that happens, the more the people up there remove themselves from the system because the system gets more and more difficult for them to deal with. As we started to say, the indigenous communities, they're the survivors. They're incredible survivors. The government's thrown everything we can at them and they're still there. And you know what the government's going to do now? It's going to throw more at them. <laughs> and they'll still be there at the other end of that. Um, this was the place you saw before, um, which I have to say as an architect because I go there and I go, who the hell planned this thing? How did the buildings end up where they are? Did anybody ever think that this was going to turn into a place a long way from nowhere that might even add up to something? And then you're looking at it going, what are the rail, what are those steel tracks in there for? What was that for? And then you go, bloody hell, there used to be a donger in there. There used to be an accommodation unit under that roof. And somehow they got it out without taking the roof off. So then you think, how bad was it that you had to pull it out of there and leave that in its place and somehow you got it out without that. So you just see all this incredible stuff which just doesn't add up. <laughs> you just wonder, how the hell does that happen? And there it is, just example upon example of it. Yep, an amazing country around it, you know. And kids, you know, kids are going to play there, aren't they? It's just, you just want to play there. Especially in the summertime in the Kimberley, it's just heaven. <laughs> really? <laughs> it was probably a government grant for play equipment. But at the same time, these guys have mustered up enough muscle and they're going to set up a little bow shelter, which is being helped by some really interesting people who you move around to assist in trades and they're going to start selling artifacts and stuff from this. They're just at the highways just to the right hand side of the photo. Um, so you see these sort of what we might call grassroots events taking place 
Uh, and the couple who both drove this Toyota and drove another one were quite interesting people and they were very happy to find Victor because they'd been chasing him all over the country to try and get hold of him. Um, and you see people doing this, but they're doing it off their own bat. They're, they're having to do it outside the system because the system is just too unwieldy. Because <clears throat> the system ends up with this kind of stuff. You know, this is the ablution facility at the community next to the homestead where I stayed. And the sink is completely unusual because it's so clogged up with calcium. Because uh, the calcium content in the water is so high. <laughs> you just go, how did the dunny end up out there? Someone disconnected it. There's no dunny in there anymore. Someone disconnected the dunny and the pan and left it there. <laughs> What's it doing there? <laughs> So nothing is useful anymore, completely useless. It's really astonishing. Bit of bush tucker, just to prove that, you know, I, I did it. Uh, that's a bush turkey. This is traditional cutting equipment um, cooked on there. And even Victor said to me, yeah, it's okay, Des, I'll put it back on and cook it a little bit more for you. <laughs> but I have to say, he, he, he cooked it a bit more so he could eat it as well. Because These guys are tough. The bush turkey was quite good, but wow. It's pretty much still turkey, that one. There's not much meat. Needs a bit more cooking. Yeah, this is the, some of the other people I worked with. Uh, and then because I'm with people like Jimmy and Joy, who... Uh, I don't know what else to say. They're just, they're just over and above the system. Um, and unfortunately, Joy's eyes are failing her. She's going to be blind in probably a couple of years, pretty much. Uh, Jimmy's 64, his sons are not much good, his daughters are amazing, working on the station, amazing. And their daughters and sons are pretty good, but they're up against it. Uh, just for the heck of it, because I was up there and I think because Vic was there as well, Jim and Joy said, oh, we'll take you through the little valley, uh, through the range out to, we haven't been out there for a while, go and have a look. So we trundled their troopy over the rocky grade to get into this unbelievable valley which is just over the back um, and even they hadn't been there for quite a while and said oh we must go out here again at some point um, it's pretty you know I was pretty darn lucky really uh, but I'm you know as Richard Well would say I'm getting to hang around the place with real Australians um, and it was pretty it was pretty amazing the country is astonishing yep yep and then on the way home, you look out the window, you go, what the hell is that? <laughs> you see a couple of them every now and again. I think the holes are mine, but I don't know what the thing with the roof on it is. And I think that's a landing strip. So I don't know. Maybe it's the CIA, I'm not sure. But you really just flow and go, it's in the middle of nowhere, like nowhere. These two perfect geometric shapes, one negative and one positive. As an architect, of course, you have to take a photo of it. You take about 10 of them. Uh, just what is it? Um, and that's a snake. Yeah, yeah that's a snake. Yeah. That's it. That's my travel log. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know if you have any questions for me, but... I was going to read Stana, but I didn't, so I always lose track of that. And I could talk for hours about the experiences and the people I met. Um, I'm probably not going to do that now, but uh, if you have any questions or whatever, please ask me about anything to do with it. I'm not phased by answering questions. How long were you up there for? Uh, surprisingly, I was out there for 12 days. Yeah. And it was 24 7 for the. 12 days, like start to finish, <coughs> wouldn't, wouldn't miss it for quids, um, and it was eye-opening, eye-opening, yeah, and I assume you're a bit like me, thinking, wow, that's pretty special, getting to hang around out there with, you know, these kind of guys, um, for whom, you know, their attachment to country is 50,000 years, it's just breathtaking, completely breathtaking. Um, Joy, who's the lady, we were all set to go to her country one day which was to travel south past Wunka Junker into the top of the Great Sandy Desert. I was really looking forward to that. But even they said, we need two vehicles, and one of the vehicles is not up for it. So in the end, we couldn't go. Um, but I would have been super, super duper lucky then to go out there with them. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs>
So what like um, values about the land which you like apply to architecture? Like you know. Um the the aesthetic stuff I still work on in the compositional techniques like minimum nature of influence, lack of hierarchy, somehow dealing with how old the landscape is, all of those things. I, I'm constantly up against them when I'm out there and I'm writing notes, taking photos. You know, that's a straight Sydney Nolan photograph. Just Without Ned Kelly, that's just the Sydney Nolan photograph of how, how, to, how the place composes itself. Um, what I do get added into it, I must say, is that, um, and it, particularly every time I go back to WA, because WA is, is pretty different to here in, in lots of ways. Um, the sheer scale is what gets you. Uh, and I must say, and I'm probably on tricky territory here, but it's something that I've been thinking about for a while. Um, it is amazing how impactful on us Indigenous culture has been, and you don't have to read many books to get that. If you read, say, Dancing with Strangers by Inga Glendinnen, and there are many others, but hers is the most compact one, um, what you do understand is the blackfellas got us much quicker than we got them. So just simple stuff, like they learn English way faster than we will learn any of their languages. And their additive culture, I see indigenous culture as additive. It's an incredible network. There are no hierarchies, which also throws us. But then this place doesn't have any hierarchies. So I start, for me, I start to see similarities between the place and the people who've been there long enough to be just like the place. So the network thing, no hierarchies, is absolutely there. And I can take a photo like that, which I think is without hierarchy, other than the one that I injected into it, which is the tree, which is alien. So even the non-sequential nature of it is available to take in a photo. Indigenous culture also in WA has huge amount of impact because there's so many places that use indigenous names. Which, and even here, just go out to Mount Moriac or Driite or any of those act places, they're all blackfellow names. But when I went to school, no one said that. No one said that. So this impact, this effect of Indigenous culture on us is something which is much stronger than we normally give credit to, um, or certainly Indigenous cultures take credence for. And I get huge lessons from that. Of course, I can't help but look at Indigenous, you know, what we call modern paintings and see them as incredibly instructive about people just translating what they understand much more inherently into a language base, a painting, that I can take apart, study, understand. Yeah? Colour, form, line, composition, everything. It's just there. Of course, I don't have any of them here, but none of those guys went to art school. <laughs> they just do it, which is also quite confounding. You just go, how do you do that? How can you just make that translation that clearly? And I get a lesson from it. Yeah. Um, so that thing of uh, how do I understand the country? For me now, because I've been lucky enough, I start to try and see lessons from Indigenous culture that I can see implanting itself or influencing whitefellow culture and then our production. Also, I must say, the nature of us as Aussies... <laughs> is quite like the place. I'm quite fascinated by that. I think lots of, most places are like that, but we're like this place. Uh, and Indigenous culture is much more like this place than we are, and, we're, and, and we get a lot from them. If you read early histories of Australia, the impact, when it, wasn't, when it wasn't brutal, the impact of Indigenous culture on the locals, like the Europeans, happens incredibly quickly. Um, and I'm kind of fascinated by that. Like Australians knew themselves as Australians much quicker than Americans called themselves Americans. Like it was only, it was only half a generation that kids called themselves Aussies, right? Not Englishmen. So I'm very interested in that. And I think the effect of place is part of that. And part of it is its sheer generosity. Can I just come in here? Yeah. See, one of the unfortunate things for... Aboriginal people in remote locations like that <coughs> is the fact that 
for whatever reason, we always end up with the people who can't make it anywhere else. Yeah, this is They end up point. in the Aboriginal community. And they have a litany of moving from one place to the other, ripping off the troops. The opportunity that I had with Des coming there, for him to see the sort of things, because he and I have been friends for over 20 years, <clears throat> and things that I was telling him and I just couldn't get through until the examples came in front of us, then I was able to say that there, e.g., that don't, we don't need to pump that tyre up because it's too on the back. You can't understand why they think like that. And then you get all these other things. And the Aboriginal people accept their lot. They think that's what they're due. And what happens if people saw a, a video on the 6th of June on ABC Four Corners called Ripped Off? In that, one guy went to the Aboriginals, he wrote out the contract, got them to sign it, where he had six times the ratio to their one. In the year 2012-2013, his income for the year, according to the audit report, was 6600000 one, one guy. One guy. It's 18000 bucks a day, seven days a week. And he paid the two Aboriginals who protected him from getting changing the uh, contract and getting uh, forensic auditors in three thousand dollars a day out of their own money, not his money, their money. And because they don't know about auditing, they don't know how to read a financial statement. And I've had architects come along, and I'm saying. Why are you asking these people what they need in the way of a design for a house? They said, oh, well, they're going to live in the house. I said, no, they're not. The government's paying for that. Taxpayers are paying for it. So you've got to design it so that they can get the maximum benefit out of that house. I said, you tell me, what are the chances of those people asking you for a mezzanine floor? They wouldn't know what a mezzanine floor is. And I've got the good fortune that young lady over there, her name is Maya. She's been here in Melbourne, down from Innisfail, with me going around with people that I've got here who's going to help me back in the Kimberleys. She's been coming up there and spending time with me there through a friend, another architect called Ian Molyneux. He's written books on architecture stuff. But these are the things that we're looking at. People who come there, not only to learn, but what it is that they can give to the community. Because the, the people there, when I say, oh, this is Professor Dear Smith, don't even know what a professor is. But he's my friend. So he's accorded everything that they can give him. And from their point of view, it's not much, but from Dear's point of view, it was a lot. And I said to him, when people say hi, Gene, here, they think they're saying hello to somebody called Gene. And you saw the conditions that people were living in and eating. But when something breaks down, the normal thing is maintenance from day one going forward, not with the troops. And the same with fishing, you know. They don't go fishing, as Jim, as Dad said, for recreation. They go fishing to survive. <laughs> and that's it. And where Jimmy has taken people in to see the paintings in the caves, they've seen it. But he very rarely takes people in there, unless it's a special occasion. And there are special people in his books. I'll finish with two things. I've got an older brother, and he can remember, he's about four or five years older than me, he can remember when policemen went past on horseback with Aboriginals naked, with chains and manacles around their neck, walking 
10, 20 of them walking behind the horse and they're going another 250 miles to where the police station was. What I remember is that the first house that the, the traditional Aboriginal people lived in was in the early 80s in, in our area. No one did anything more than give them the key to the house. They didn't show them how to get the maximum benefit out of it. They didn't talk to them about orientation, where the sun came up, what sort of ceiling height you needed, and all of these things. They just gave them a house that they thought was Allah, wherever. And it's the same as when English people came here, they tried to bring England here to this country. So when you go out and you design, and if you happen to be working in an Aboriginal community, you've got to think what is best suited for them, and that's part of your training. And even the location where, you, where they put that house, because they, in some of these houses they've been located in a place where they picked, and they've driven there in uh, June, July, but in December, January, and February, water's about eight foot high around where the house is. And so they've got to build the houses on big mounds and pump the tanks out after every rain. And there's one house, one community where there's 12 houses, a shed. Nobody's lived in those 12 houses for 28 years. And they cost, at, when they were built, 350,000 when they were built, but they're still there today. Thank you. But any questions in that? <coughs> any other questions? Why are the lights on? Because no one turned them off. Okay. It's as simple as that. And the, the people who, like the people who, who live in the houses, um, and it's really, it's scary, but it, when, I, when I describe it, it'll sound like it's their fault, but it, I'm saying it matter-of-factly, so there's no blame involved, okay? So every community has, because they're all off the grid, they should have solar, it's just, it's so dumb, it's scary, but you know, they've all got a diesel generator, right? And the diesel generator goes 24-7, right? So... People just leave the lights on because it doesn't cost them anything. Someone puts the diesel in, the generator's on, the power's there, big deal. So we heard stories, and this, these ones, it gets really scary. The guy came around to that community and he happens to work for the guy who ripped off the, the other communities for 6.6 .6 million bucks in one year. It's completely damning. But anyway, his company has a maintenance contract. So this young bloke comes here at a you know, pretty brand new Nissan Ute and he does the maintenance. He's a nice guy, does the maintenance on the generator. And I said to him, what was the usage on the generator? And he said to me, well, the fence has been cut again, which means someone's got in, yeah. And he said, so when you say usage, you mean how much the generator used or how many jerry cans worth? Because <laughs> people drive out there, right? Because it's 120 k's back to Fitzroy, and so in terms of diesel, it's like around trips 45 bucks, 50 bucks worth of fuel, yeah? So people go, let's go out to the community. It's completely fair enough, nothing else to do. All get in the vehicle, drive out of the community, shit, we've got any fuel. Have to get back to town. Ah, oh, easy. Let's get it from the generator. Not a problem. It's not malicious, it's just, well, we're stuck out here and we have to get back. Um, the guys I was staying with told us a story. I think it was them who told me. It might have been Victor. And I'd been up to this community, one other, near this community another time. Community a long, long way away from Derby, like 600 k's on a dirt road, serious dirt road. Like a serious trip to get there. There's a community up there, and there's a couple of black fellows who are up there fishing. And they call into this remote community, because even they thought it was amazing. Call into this community. It's in the middle of, no, edge of nowhere. And there's one guy there, 
this guy, they go, I don't know how long he's been there. There's one guy there. And then when they're leaving, the guy says, can you give me a lift? They say, sure, no problem. So they give him a lift. And about 200 k's in, they said to the guy they gave a lift to, is there anybody else out there? And he said, no, no, there's anybody out there for months. And then they said, did you turn the generator off? And he went, why would I turn the generator off? But the truck supplying the diesel will do the eight hour trip out there to put diesel in the tank. There's no one there signing the script, no one checking how much diesel went into it. Of course it was empty, again, whether it was or not. It just goes on and on. The matter of fact, it's like, why would I turn the generator off? It's not my generator. It's not my problem. The fact that he's so far from anywhere is a completely other story. We were there one night, and I just love these stories. We were there one night, because even Victor had to laugh. You can hear a car coming up the road. <laughs> it's in the, it's in the night, we're all sitting around the fire. You can hear a car coming, there's no lights. Sure enough, this car comes around and parks in the car park where we're staying. And a few people get out, and I'm going, the car's got no lights. Uh, but one of the girls gets in the car, and they're going fishing. So I, I stupidly said to someone, I, said, I think I said to Billy, I said, Hey, Billy, how come the car's got no lights? And he looked at me and he said, because they don't work. <laughs> Which wasn't really what I was asking, but it was completely the correct answer. But then it got better. He said, it's okay, they've got a torch for the creek crossings. So they're driving on the dirt. We're a long way from the highway. The road's pretty rugged. He said, it's fine, they've got a torch for the creek crossings. Well, they came back with six turkeys and a whole lot of fish. And we got one of the turkeys. And sure enough, two nights later, the same car with lights that don't work did the trip again. It was completely, everybody was completely cool with it. Yeah. Why don't you drive the car with lights? Why do, why do, it's a full moon, don't need the lights, it's not a problem. You've got a torch. What about when the torch runs out of batteries? Well, we'll get over that when that happens. Is that a problem? <laughs> they just know the place, and they, these guys weren't really old. They just know the place so completely. And Victor's right, they're just going out. They're not going out for fun. They're going out to catch fish, catch barramundi. Good tucker. Great, they're really good at it. No lights on the car, <laughs> big deal. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. They didn't treat the stereotype, they did they? No, absolutely not, no. The people I was staying with did not fit the stereotype. You know, they weren't lazy, they weren't indolent, they weren't abusive. There was no booze there, but you know, there was no violence, nothing. But you hear stories that just scare you about, you know, the mistreatment and the maltreatment and what people do to one another, but I got absolutely none of that. And it was the same at the Fitzroy Crossing Inn. It was completely quiet. Um, Victor was telling me, you know, buy this guy a beer, Des. So, and I thought, shit, I can't do that. I can't just buy a guy a beer. And Victor's going, no, no, buy him a beer because it'd be really special that you know, you're a friend of mine and you bought him a beer, you'll feel really good about it. So I do it and I go, I don't know whether, is that, is that good or bad? But the guy was really incredibly friendly, chatting to me, chatting with Victor, left, see you later, see you later, Des. <laughs> nothing malicious, nothing at all, just thanks very much, it's really, it really nice of you. My fella came into the bar and bought me a beer, shit, it's amazing. Yeah. Victor will tell you stories about you know, me, me speaking to people and then them saying to Victor later, saying that's, that's the first white fellow who's ever spoke to me and not asked for something. Or not wanted to give me something. And wanted to sell me a service. <clears throat> this is where Pearson's thing gets difficult because the black fellows are complete users of services. They're never asked to supply any services. So that's where the lack of responsibility thing comes from. But it's not lack of responsibility, it's just like they're not allowed to do anything. You can ask an indigenous mother, what will your son be, where will your son be at 18? I'll go, he's in jail. And you go, well, that's really bad. And they go, why is it bad? That's just, you asked me the question. The fact is, that's where we'll be. So if, if that's not the right answer, well, then ask me the right question. But we think, oh, don't you extrapolate out that this is it? He goes, no, the question is, where will your son be when he's 18? Probably in jail. That's the correct answer. Don't you feel like that's your responsibility? The mother goes, no, because... The government looks after him. That's what happens. <laughs> so you, uh, if you're the driver at a random rate, it's unknown, do you welcome? Or do you need to drive something? 
Uh, Victor might be able to answer that better than me. If, we were, if I was to drive out there randomly, would I be welcome? Of course you would. Yeah. 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 With their rooms, and I ask them, who, do you, who told you, who gave you my name? And if they can't tell me anybody I know, I tell them, if you want to help an Aboriginal, it's just like playing rugby, go and tag them. You can help them. But if you come in and you've got the name that you can give, then people will look after you. If that person has done something for them. And in, in some places, if you talk about some of the things that you want to do and what they do, you can do what you can do for them. Um, then it's it. But when I, way back in the 80s, I went on holidays in, in New South Wales. Uh, and what I did is I just travelled around and I went to the hotels with the Aboriginal workers. And I just said to them, I'll go and buy food down the store. If you let me come to your place, I'll cook your tea. And they think it's a game of because if you go there on Slack Week, which is the A week and they're hungry, then you can buy the food and cook for the other gym. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. Kevin. There's, um, might be a difficult question, but I, I guess I'm trying to get, get an idea about uh, the late Paul Floros and his work um, in relationship to the, the mindset that you've. Uh, you've Illustrated because obviously he was talking a lot about just getting the basics right, getting fixing the, the services and amenities and getting all that right. But obviously you are painting quite a different picture to that. I'm just curious how, how how do you see that? Yeah, well look, I I have the side that you know, and if I ask Victor about Paul Fuleris and Health Habitat, Victor will say they didn't really help anybody because they didn't leave they didn't leave the systems or teach people what to do. Am I correct in saying that, Victor? See, health habitat works on sweat equity. So if they do something for you, they then want you to do something for someone else. And the other people think, you know, you, if we've had, from government, government's made them dependent on, on a whole range of things. And that's why I say that no one can outlay an average because he can wait forever, he knows government's coming. And it doesn't matter whether it's two, three, or four, or five years that way. And I'm trying to tell them here I've got an architect, I've got an engineer, I've got a builder who can supervise. You're an Australian, you're entitled to a $10,000 first homeowner's grant. So all you've got to do is borrow $70,000, you don't have to pay for the land. <coughs> you can have a house. They think about it and they say, no, I'll make for government. And government is my biggest competitor. And I told them, get out of the business and let me do things, because I've got people who can do it. And uh, we are the biggest industry in the Kimberleys. We employ more people, we provide subsidised housing, for got public service. So a teacher, a policeman, or any public service doesn't have to pay in a remote location, doesn't have to pay rent, doesn't have to pay electricity, doesn't have to pay water, or any rubbish administration. So whatever they get paid is all cop. They leave, but nothing changes for the troops. This is the this is the really tricky bit, yeah. Um, you know, Victor calls them Dolly Partons, nine to five, <laughs> uh, and then they go. And I mean, I'm, you know, I, I wasn't doing anything, but in effect, I can't help but think, well, that's that's that was kind of me. Like I go there for two weeks, it's fantastic for me. Um, but Vic will say. It's great that I'm talking about this and maybe allowing you guys to understand a bit more uh, because that's, that is something which ends up quite valuable for these guys that more people know. Is this, am I got this right, Vic? Yeah. Um, it's an incredibly confusing situation, that's where, because you see the goodwill of all that, but then it doesn't go anywhere. This is what I saw time and time and time again. You know, it just doesn't go anywhere because. The way that the different cultures integrate or disintegrate 
is the most is the trickiest thing. It is the trickiest thing, especially when these guys they're just so fucking tough. And, and Paul they're just is supposedly even meant to be in the sort of top end of all that. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's what's really difficult. That's what's really difficult. Yeah. And even at the other even at the other end, because because the tribal and family natures also get in the way. Because on the way out to where we went and mustered the cattle, we drove into a property called Mingle Kala, which is a place where I went to the last time I went out with Victor. And there was a young guy from Fitzroy Crossing, Stanley, who, the same as Jimmy, one day after a big bender just said, that's it, I'm never drinking again, which is a pretty tough call. So he never drank again. And he said, I'm going to set up a community, right? I'm just going to do it. He's not very old. He was in his late 20s, early 30s. And I went out there. I don't have photos on this, on this machine. But they had houses... They had school classrooms, they had solar generators, they got everything there. And you ask Stanley, where did you get all this from? He said, got it for free. It's all stuff that people didn't want. So we just, I just found them, because everybody knows what's going on. I just waited till it came up, waited till someone had a truck, and we'd go and get that one, and we'd take it out to the property. And then, over a number of years, right? Amazing place, yeah? This time we went up there, completely abandoned. Completely abandoned. No government money required, nothing. No grants. You ask Dan, he says, I'm not having anything to do with government. We're just doing this. Four years later, I go out there, it's empty. No one using it anymore because it's been a kind of a family dispute and it no longer works and it's too far from town and people don't want to travel out there. Am I right, Vic? So it's, it's sitting there just wasting away. There was one guy there one day, luckily, because we ran out of fuel or something and oil and luckily there was someone there and we could get it but that was just a fluke so it works in both directions so you end up against this this kind of family structure this kind of responsibility tribal structure which can also just empty things out yeah so it's very it is really really complex um, but it's completely and totally fascinating as well particularly because you know just like these guys you just go wow they just you just know this place so uh, incredibly. Yeah. Um, Vic shared the read with me. Um, so that was an interesting read. Um, what key elements from your experience would you like to relate to the breed and what students can do? Uh, oh, for the third years. Um, well, actually, in, in a sense, I don't have anything key that I want them to do because yeah. I just wrote the brief and I just want the students to deal with it however, however it comes because it's primarily an, it's an architectural instruction for them. And I can answer, I can put my two bobs worth in if someone has an issue. And I'll call that kind of primary research, if you like. Um, but I have to say that for me, whenever I issue a project to someone, I don't do the project. Uh, for me, it's important that I don't do the project. Otherwise, I'm just adjudicating people's work against what I would do, and I don't, I don't want to do that. There are certain things that I'm hoping that people will get a bit more illumination about. And some of it is to do with, particularly as people like Stana have written, and I've tried to make clear this, the nature of Indigenous culture and its correlation to the way we structure things, like the completely different structural systems, and then the fact that Indigenous culture is much more additive than we are. So to some degree, whatever the guys might propose in the studio, the black fellas will probably suck it up faster and harder than the white fellas will, because <laughs> it's just it's just the nature of their nature. Yeah. Um, but in terms of me hoping someone does something, I don't I don't really work like that. So I'm not trying not to answer the question, other than I I tend not to do that. Yeah. 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 Any others? Otherwise, I'll just tell you anecdotes for the next two hours. Yeah. Just describing. <clears throat> when you talk about Aboriginal people, uh, when we're talking about the people in the remote locations, yeah. when you look at Australia, you see 200 years, I'm talking in round figures, 200 years of white contact on the east coast, Perth and the south west, 150 years. Where we are in Kimberley's and the Pilbara in parts of the territory, 100 years. When you go to the Northern Territory, WA, South Australian border, only 50 years of white contact. I've got a sister 
we've got the same father but a different mother. We think she's 84 because she's born in the bush under a tree and she can talk 16 different dialects from the local area. But when she dies, not one of her children, grandchildren or great-grandchildren can speak any of those languages. And she says, if we send these kids, and she fosters a lot of children, she says, if we send these children to school, what's wrong with the school? Can't they teach them? There is no enrichment in the home. Nobody really stories to them. And no structure in terms of bedtimes, and there's no guarantee that the bed they slept in last night is the bed they're going to sleep in tonight. So when they go to school, and it's like running in a race, the further behind you get, the slower you run when you just piss off home. And two schools, one in Fitzroy Crossing, close on $40 million worth of buildings and structures and articulation of everything. 37% daily attendance. You go to Balls Creek, only 46% daily attendance. And yet the government is concentrating on educating children. I'm saying the trouble is these children grow up and all your programs are for the bad guys. You've got no program for the good guys. So someone um, goes to jail, they, beat, they just built a $123 million prison in Derby. And we're only 2% of the national population, we're 86% of the jail population. And these children are growing up, having children of their own, dying, never having a job. And we see this, and that's why I'm saying for young people, you can study here the guarantee of every one of you getting a job when you get out of here. It's pretty scary because of the way things are. But in the Aboriginal community, no one has been successful, including me. I've got a lot of hypotheses, but I've not been able to prove it because I haven't got the money and the dead coming here and, and this people here. Hopefully, that some of you here will come up with, with an idea on how we can do that. Because the Bureau of Stats telling us in every facet of Aboriginal society, health, education, welfare, housing, employment, a lot, none of them are working. And yet people profess to have good ideas that they're going to go somewhere. And I'm saying, change will only happen for the people for whom change is necessary when they do something about it. And that's what that's the these tricky people thing. here that yep. I go to. <coughs> I tell, you know, I was talking to Dad, I'm saying, these people have a, what the sociologists call an external locus of control. When you say, what do you reckon? They say, what do you reckon I reckon? They don't want to be making a decision because of the oppressed people. The greatest fear any oppressed person can have is the fear of freedom, and making a decision is one of those fears of freedom. So they don't even know how to do that. In the topic of words that they, that they've been talking about, they don't want to be spotlighted about anything. So if they come and tell you that I did something, then you, you stand up and say, oh, Victor did it, and I'll say, well, who told you that? And you say, he did. No, no, I never said anything. And you, you, you get the, the humour that underlies all of this. I, I took a group of six to Perth once, and one of them was, I'm, I'm in the hotel room, I get, a, I get a phone call, four o'clock in the morning, this guy's telling me, it's Tommy here, I'm looking in this window and there's all these tattoos. Where am I? I don't bloody know. So <laughs> <laughs> cuts out. <laughs> I'm nowhere in daddy shop in Perth. And so just standing in front of them. But that's the sort of thing you're looking at. And, you know, the guy, one uncle went to court and when JPs to jail people, and when he pleaded guilty, and the JP was a evangelical Christian like and he wanted to give him a fair go. So the question he asked him, have you ever been up before me? And the old bloke said, I don't know. He said, what you get up? <laughs> but these are real stories. This is not a guy pulling jokes in court. This is for real. So, yeah. so th this is the thing that you're looking at. You know, the women, the old women who can't read and write, we ask them, what bus you came on, you know, from one town to the next? They said, oh, we've been coming on that skinny dog bus. And they have a great 
that's, you can't read and write. That's, that's, and that's the thing right through. And it's the matriarchs in the community, and that's why I prefer to work with women. Because the men piss off and go home the first time they fall over. But the women just keep on going. It's an amazing situation. It is an amazing situation. And yet, in the background is just unbelievable cultural depth. It's, it is breathtaking. But the scary bit is about, like, Victor's sister, 16 languages, when she goes, it's done. Um, Victor refers to her as an endangered species. Because she is. It's really scary. It's really scary. Um, I don't know. I don't know what what to do about that, but it is, as an Aussie, it's amazing that it's live happening now. It must be even more live for someone like Victor. Yeah. Um, I, I will say one other thing, which was, uh, and, and then I'll finish, that, that one thing that I didn't bring up, and it's something that Victor and I have spoken about a lot, and I'm just going to send it back out to you, it's this kind of institutionalised racism as well, which is also part and parcel of, you know, architects going to an Indigenous community and asking someone what, what kind of house they want, right? Because, you know, they're supposed to be able, you know, it's good for them to be free enough to give a response, and it's bad for me as an architect to go and sort of impinge on them about what a good thing is, whereas in a white community that wouldn't be the case. But the other side of the institutionalised racism, which I think is the very interesting one, is when you meet someone like Victor, and he'll, he could tell you millions of stories about this one, but you meet someone like Victor... And he's a sharp guy, and he knows how we operate, and he also knows how the black fellows operate. And it's very difficult for you not to think, well, Victor understands our values, and therefore he'll come over and join our team to help us work out for the black fellows. And Victor, I love his phrase for it, and correct me if I didn't get it right, but Victor says, you, you blokes are always the same. You never want a good football game. You want all the good players on your side. He says, I'm not interested in playing for your team. I want to stay play with my team so we can all have a good football game because I want to play for my side, not your side. Okay? And the problem with people like, the challenge with people like, I assume, Noel Pearson, etc., and Pat Dodson, is they end up playing on our side. They're playing for our, our team now. And we feel good about it. Stanner has a, I won't find it quickly enough, Stanner has a great phrase about that, that it makes us feel better for that. But people like Victor, and certainly his sisters and his brothers, they're, they're playing for the other side still. They're trying to get us to understand what the other side is on about by still playing for that side. And I've seen it happen with Victor where it's, it's, you can see people going, especially white fellas, going, Victor's a good guy, he, he's like us. <laughs> and Victor's going, no, no, I'm not like you and I don't want to be like you. It's just that I understand you. And I'm trying to use my intelligence to get you to understand that situation. But it's very easy for us, because we're in the power side, to feel like guys like Victor really want to play for us, to help us in the opposite situation. And that's not really what he wants to do. That's why I feel incredibly privileged when I go up there. And these guys, just they just accept me. They just take me straight in. And as Vic would say, and I don't go there to be a pretend black fella. That's not what I'm there for. And they don't want me to do that. Because if that happens, that's me also being powerful enough to be a pretend black fella. It's better if I'm just a white fella. Being in awe and very gracious with their generosity and vice versa. Because they were very gracious about me being there. I thought it was great that I was there. I thought it was great that, you know, there was another, let's be honest, there was another brain there thinking for Jimmy. Because I can't help it. I just Victor said he wants me to go back up there so I can teach them more about the way white fellas structure their thinking when you're in white fella structure, which is what running a station is. Um, it's complex. Victor, would you say that you like your sister you're in danger? I can't hear Would you say that you, like your sister, are, is an, are an endangered species as well? And that's in the work. Well, the, 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 the chances are, see, when people have choices, when people have choices that they can make and they can then decide whether they're going to go down that road or not, that's, that's a really good thing. And 
the and when I go when I go there and I talk philosophy to them, I mean I don't tell them the dog's name is philosophy, you can call the dog whatever you like, but it's still philosophy, you know. Because you're asking them what to think and generally all all the all my sentences when I talk to them is can you help me what do you think of this and all of that? So it's always an open question to get them to think and and Billy is now starting to talk now and engage, but they can sit down for three, four hours, not say a word and just listen to the conversation around. And I can ask them to participate by putting the question to them. But it's, you've got no idea of what they know and what their skill that, skills are until you actually see them doing something. Because they won't volunteer any of that. Because they can't, they don't have the vocabulary and they can't articulate that. But when you are with them, be they male or female, and you're talking to them, um, it's, that's when you get it out. Because see, and one of the things that I do like about Aboriginal culture is that ignorance is an excuse. So if you, if you haven't been through the law, and you transgress, it's because you didn't know. But in white society, that's not the case. So, with, I've, I've had situations where I've been in a vehicle in the middle of the, three of us in the car, I've been in the middle of the driver and the other one was on the passenger side. And Glenn has run across the road, middle of the day, no cloud, he ran around a termite mound and went into a hole. This guy walks over to it, reaches into his pocket, he pulled that little tiny pocket mirror, and he reflects the sun rays into the hole and lights a hole up. He said, oh, there's his tail, and he pulls a man out and bangs and kills it. I'm saying every back on the car walks around with a bloody piece of glass, a piece of mirror in their pocket. And this is the middle of nowhere. It's, these people, they always surprise you, they don't see it as outside the norm. But, tre but Trevor was asking whether you're an endangered species. Huh? Trevor was asking whether you think you're an endangered species. You. Me? Yeah. No. Right. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so Victor's crossover man. That's his, that's his skill set. Yeah. He knows us and he knows black fellas. Yeah, so my question is, is that, that seems like a rarity. And is that becoming more rare or less rare. What's that is? Explain. You, you, you as crossover man, is that a rare thing now? Are there other people like you? Um, it's only Jimmy that I've met that I want to be yeah. like if I'm not me, that's all. I've not met any other. It's, it's really a generosity <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yeah. He is quite an unusual character. Yeah. Because of his because of his openness, but his family's like that. I've met a couple of his sisters. Yeah. I mean, he, he, this guy's so oh, I don't mind saying this guy's so rare that in his family there's two orders of Australia and two two PhDs, and he's not one of them. <laughs> that's pretty. That's for any family. That's pretty remarkable for a blackfellow family from the West Kimberley. That's amazing. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. So his family might be an endangered species because they're just. But that's just rare. It's not. It's not like his aunt, his sister. Who's, who's an endangered species because just knowing 16 languages, 16 dialects is just quite incredible. The scary bit for her though is that no one in her immediate family trail is like her. So she's the end of the line. Jimmy's the same. Jimmy, it's really difficult for Jimmy because none of his sons are picking up the mantle that he's now carrying. But his daughters are. But it's a, it's a difficult thing for his daughters to, they probably won't be station managers. So some of his skill set, and it's because he's, he's a guy and they're women, the traditional crossover can't happen. So it gets, it gets tricky. Yeah. It's weird. Am I correct? No, I think I'm correct in saying See, that. Yeah. In 2000, I was sitting down at the hotel with my mate looking at my page. I was paying 49 cents in the dollar tax, P A Y E. I said to my mate, I said, I'll put one day for Johnny out and one day for me. So I quit. 
I went out to the community for what, six years. I didn't do anything. I just went fishing and hunting and just lived in the community. And then people started asking me to help them do this and do that. Next thing I'm back on the merry-go-round. But I've not had a pay job since 2000. And the, the thing with it is that whole aspect of when you're working, how much money do you want, what do you want it for, and what are you going to do with it when you go up the hill? Because See, I told you it was rare. It hasn't worked since 2000. How did you get here? Somehow we got here. How did you get here? Somehow we got here again. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing, Victor. It's amazing. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 there'd be a lot of people in this room thinking, shit, that's my job. I want that job. <laughs> yeah. It's not easy. I, I can vouch for that bit. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> when I go back to the community, like, someone will say, I want you to go to, like last year they said, I want you to go to France to Charles or Mezier, so I go to France. I come back, go to the community. No one asked me where I've been, what I've been doing, and I'm there. They don't say, what, what do you really mean? I went to China, come back, go there. No. They don't ask you anything, they're here. And, and generally, when people who want to come there and, and put up with the lifestyle, they don't want to leave. And he was the case in point. Sure. Would happily have stayed there for much longer. I feel like I should still be there, kind of lending a hand. Don't have to help you bastards. So. <laughs> Jimmy worried about your welfare. Yeah, I know. It's just it's amazing. He's worried about me. Jesus. Should buy him a new hat. <laughs> Jimmy never went to school past 10 year old. He was riding horses at 10 year old. His grandson, Lyle, was able to drive bulldozers, drive graders, bobcats at 12 year old. He'd go out with Jimmy when Jimmy would do those things. But no academic education. And because my background is teaching. And I tell people education is forever, it doesn't have to be academic. And, and the thing You're not allowed to say that here, Victor. The more that people uh, do things and travel around, they that Maya rang up out of the blue after my mate that he rang brings me. So yeah, you can come. And now we're going to be the richer for it in, in that community. Yeah, that's that's the bit that I have to feel very grateful for. That you know, both I assume both these guys and me get a huge amount from that. That's pretty rare these days. Unfortunately, it's pretty rare. So even though Dan's gone, I think it's Dan. Um, you know, if you do rock into those communities, Victor's right. They are incredibly generous. It's just you have to get past the image of them, and they just look completely dishevelled and dangerous. They just it just dials up. They just dials up danger. The the woman who, the couple who are building the bow shelter, the woman, the 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 wife, she was amazing. Um, she had stories about helping blackfellas. She said recently, in the middle of the night, she was driving down a dirt road and there was a Commodore off the road and there were 12 young Aboriginal blokes there with a dead car, right? And she pulled up, no problems. Pulled them out of the bog, got them going, felt completely safe. She said, if it was night time and there were even three white fellas there where they were, she probably wouldn't pull over. And she was serious. She just said, I felt completely no problems about doing it. Um, more probably because there's a big chance where she was that she, knew, she would know someone either who was there or someone who knew one of those guys. And just like Victor said, as soon as you can say a name, you're in. So that kind of evenness is quite different to the way we would operate. Uh, but she said she just felt completely safe by it. And just, you know just for sheer raw numbers, because it still was amazing. Um, she, would, she would travel around everywhere, she was an amazing lady. Uh, and she was in a Toyota, Toyota Prado, and I just asked her, you know, boy stuff, you know, how's the Prado? She said, oh, it's pretty good. Um, how long you had it? Uh, 
it's just about three years. How many Ks you done? He said, just about to tip over 320,000 Ks. <laughs> so I go, you drive it a bit, do you? She said, yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> and that was her driving. And she was out there dealing with teaching these guys trades, getting them out of jail, getting their jail time used up in community service. Amazing people. So you do see quite incredible people helping and assisting. But shit, they're up against it, I tell you. Anyway, we should call it quits because we've gone on for way too long. So, thanks, Victor, for hooking in as well. So, thanks, guys.